From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We want to start out with a check on the markets, and for that, we turn to Abigail Doolittle. So you keep talking about choppy, sort of uncertain. What's going on with the markets? They were up, now they're down. That would pretty much nail it on the day, David. It is pretty choppy this, mor this morning on this Monday. Uh, earlier, you did have stocks higher. The S&P 500 up by about half a percent now, down about four-tenths of one percent. So stocks, investors, traders really searching for direction. So many different pieces of news uh, for investors to, at this point, digest. So we see the Bears winning a little bit, but of course it comes after a, a multi-week winning streak for the major averages here in the U.S. So nothing too decisive where we have a little extra strength. The Dow transports, that's really being driven uh, by the airlines. And one reason to think the Bears won't run away with it on the day, we do actually have uh, Haven bonds trading lower. As for the airlines, recently there was a uh, 1 million on a daily basis, more than 1 million uh, passengers Flu, so that of course is a macro package or positive. And then David, as we were talking about last week on days when the airlines were higher, it suggests there's some optimism on the part of those traders that maybe some sort of stimulus, at least around airlines, could get done. Of course, we have that Tuesday deadline. So, so much uncertainty, uh, but the price generally tells the story and airlines have been outperforming more recently. Abigail, you had a passing reference there to the Haven bonds, as you call them. Are we starting to get some movement in the 10-year yield? Because it has been just locked down. Yeah, you know, we are still in that range. It's pretty amazing. Today, the 10-year yield is trying to move toward the top of that range, the range being about 60 basis points to 80 basis points. You really have the Fed in there as a buyer keeping bonds in that range. Uh, it's hard to know whether or not it will be broken. And, you know, another market, David, that I'd like to bring up today is Amazon, because the reason that you have the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ down, you now have Amazon down for a fourth day in a row, uh, its longest losing streak in a month. This, of course, after the Prime Day event, suggesting some folks out there may may not be too optimistic about those results, whether or not uh, Americans have had some online shopping fatigue this year in the year of the pandemic, David. Okay, thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for getting us started today. One of the risks that the markets are pricing in, or at least trying to, is the continued possibility of more stimulus and also the election, which is now 15 days away. Welcome now, Greg Villiers. He is Chief U.S. Policy Strategist at AGF Investments. Always a delight to have you with us, Greg. Let's start with the election first, because you have a note out that says, don't count this over yet. I mean, there's been a stubborn advantage that uh, former Vice President Joe Biden has had, but that seems to be eroding, maybe a little? Maybe a little, David. Great to be with you. Uh, the polls in the last few days show that in several key battleground states, Pennsylvania in particular, Biden's lead is not insurmountable. He's got a lead, but it's, it's like three, four, five points in a lot of these states. At the same time, one of the things I hear again and again and again is if you look at where Hillary Clinton was compared yep. with Donald Trump four years ago in some of those key states, uh, actually she had a bigger lead over uh, Mr. Trump than what uh, Mr. Biden does today. Yeah, I mean, everybody assumes that Biden is going to hang on and win Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. But as you say, four years ago, Hillary Clinton was doing even better and lost all three. Do we think we're any better at the state forecasting? I mean, we remember four years ago, everybody was very tough on the pollsters, but the national polls were pretty close. We were within 1 percent. It was in some of the states we had problems. Do we think we're doing any better job state by state? Well, I think the poll takers do a pretty good job in getting the secret sauce just right of their respondents, you know, rich, old, poor, white, black, whatever. They, they, they have that down. What they don't have down, in my opinion, is turnout. That's very hard to measure. Well, particularly in a year when we might have such enormous turnout in form of mail-in, it's really hard to get our arms around that. Mm -hmm. uh, let's turn to something else going on in Washington, which is this drama, continuing drama, over stimulus. Now we're told we have a deadline of tomorrow. Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, has said, said till tomorrow. What is going on with this? And as a practical matter, does Mitch McConnell have the votes even if he wants to get them? No, he doesn't. And that, to me, this makes this whole thing kind of a hype, a waste of time, because they keep saying, well, Pelosi might get a deal with Mnuchin. She might. There's an outside chance they could do that tomorrow. But the chances that Republicans in Congress would approve a $2 trillion deal, those chances are close to zero. Well, and so that doesn't matter even if President Trump wants it and Steve Mnuchin wants it uh, desperately. Does that actually set this up for the election a bit that it is the Republicans' fault? Maybe not President Trump's fault, but it's the Republicans' fault. 
Well, that's a narrative that Pelosi certainly would like to reinforce, and I think she will continue to do that. I think she's in no rush to do a favor to Trump or the Republicans. Again, she might cut a deal, but then she'll say, well, the Republicans never uh, would approve it in Congress. So either way you slice it, I don't think we're going to get a stimulus deal probably until after the inauguration. Well, that's the question, though, because a lot of people also say, okay, it's more a matter of when, not if. And you could get one in the lame duck, or certainly if not the lame duck, at least after we have a new Congress in January. Do you share that view? Yeah, I do. And it's a, it's a big deal for the markets. The markets want a deal. It's a big deal for individuals who increasingly worry about foreclosures and bankruptcies and small businesses. Uh, and there will be one at some point. Uh, I just fear that it could be early February before it's signed into law. So, so we talked about the presidential election. There are also these Senate elections, as well yep. as all the House. Committee. And so, it really, the, the balance in the Senate could really be determined on November 3rd. Does the stimulus, no stimulus play in some of the Senate elections in a way that may not in the presidential? It sure does. And I think tomorrow uh, or the next day when McConnell holds a, a show vote, someone like Susan Collins of Maine, who's in trouble, uh, a Republican moderate, would love to say, yes, I supported this bill. So it could help some of them. Uh, I think the toughest call of all is still the Senate. I think Biden's going to win. But the Senate is a really, really tough call. It might wind up a tie. And if that happens, the winning party, theoretically the Democrats, would break that tie. Well, come election night, which Senate races will you be looking at particularly to determine whether it is close or a tie or whether, in fact, there's a decided move to the blue? Yeah, instead of the, the usual suspects, I might look for a, a surprise. South Carolina, Lindsey Graham, up in Montana, Alaska, Iowa, which is where a Republican incumbent now is, is, is trailing. So there could be a surprise or two. But uh, the, the, the otherwise, I think that it's pretty likely Republicans will lose four, the Democrats will lose one. Uh, that's a tie, but I think there'll be a surprise or two. Well, talking about surprises, what about the possibility of Republicans picking up one or twos? For, for example, in Michigan, that race seems to yeah. be much harder to determine than people would have thought. You're absolutely right. Even though uh, Biden's doing pretty well in Michigan, the Democrat is, is not doing very well. So it, e either way you slice it, the, the, there's going to be a majority in the Senate, if at most one or two. And an uh, interesting sidebar, very quickly, Elizabeth Warren, I think, would love to be Treasury Secretary, but they may not be able to spare her Senate seat in Massachusetts. The governor of Massachusetts is a Republican. If she left, he, she would be replaced by a Republican. So that may preclude her from any hopes of being Treasury Secretary. Yeah, that's a tough call to make. Elizabeth, I'd love to have you Treasury Secretary. You're just too valuable. I can't <laughs> yeah, afford exactly. to put you in there. That'd be pretty tough. There you go. <laughs> okay. Greg, thank you so much for All being right. with us. That's Greg Valliere. He is Chief U.S. Policy Strategist at AGF Investments. Tomorrow, we're going to be speaking with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. That's going to come up at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Coming up here, the head of SIFMA, Ken Benson, is here on how the securities industry has adjusted to COVID-19 and what issues lie ahead in Washington regulation. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We turn now to Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. David, thank you. The Supreme Court has agreed to hear President Trump's appeal of a case involving the border wall with Mexico. Two federal appeals court rulings were aimed at blocking the president from using Pentagon funds to build more than 100 miles of fencing. The $2.5 billion was originally appropriated for other purposes. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has set a deadline if President Trump wants a pre-election stimulus plan. She says there has to be more progress with the White House on a deal by tomorrow. The president has said he's willing to go higher than the $1.8 trillion his team has been trying to offer the speaker. But Senate Republicans may not go along with something that large. The number of coronavirus cases around the world has now hit 40 million. Infections have been picking up in Europe and the U.S. Midwest. It took six months to reach the first 10 million cases. The last 10 million were added in just 32 days. The United States, India, and Brazil account for more than half the cases. We are one step closer to what could be the world's largest IPO. Jack Ma's Ant Group has won a key approval from Chinese regulators. They say Ant can list its shares in Hong Kong. 
and also plans to list shares in Shanghai at the same time. The company could raise about $35 billion from the dual listing. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Mark. The Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association, or SIFMA, is holding its annual meeting right now, virtually, of course, as it comes to terms with a very different world from the one it faced just one year ago. Welcome now, Ken Benson. He is SIFMA CEO to take us through what they're discussing. So welcome, Ken. Congratulations on getting this very substantial conference going. Give us a sense of what the industry has had to react to with the pandemic. Yeah, that, David, thank you for having us um, or having me. Um, it's really quite something, and we've been talking about it this morning. I think we'll talk about it through the rest of this conference. Uh, you know, with everything going on, COVID is really the the, the thing that's front and center. Um, you know, going back to March 13th, when people started testing going remote in the U.S. and ultimately did go remote, um, the, the industry has had to adopt to this. And uh, I mentioned a couple of things that, that are going on. So we, we uh, consistently survey our members uh, on, you know, on their working remote plans, returning to office plans. And what we found from, you know, the, say, spring to the summer, uh, there was optimism of getting more and more people back in after being about 95% remote. Then you get to post Labor Day, and those that optimism has been tempered. Uh, you firms are reporting, you know, five to 30% people in the office, primarily front office sales and trading, um, but still a significant number of working remote. And that seems to be the tenor going into the end of the year. I, I think firms are still waiting to see when they make the next phase change, and that could spread well into well into next year. And there are a number of factors with that. So uh, the other thing I'd point out is we are uh, releasing today uh, uh, an initial uh, lessons learned report with our uh, colleagues at Protivity. And I just hit on a couple of points in there uh, that we focus, that firms are focusing on. Number one is health and wellness of their people is paramount to anything else that's going on. Uh, number two is that firms need to, and will need to undertake after action reports uh, after this effort. Uh, number three is to ensure that uh, their operational resiliency with respect to third party and global operations uh, is sufficient. Uh, number four is to invest and embrace in automation and digitization, which the industry has largely done and has proven to be quite beneficial. Number four is to continue to collaborate with regulators. There's been a tremendous amount of collaboration going back to the March-April timeframe and throughout the summer and into the fall. And now there's a lot of looking at what do we do in the post-pandemic period uh, where we will see the need to move for dematerialization of securities, moving to things like e-delivery, uh, uh, building the processes where you will have some form of permanent uh, working remote operations. Uh, in addition, building out the technology platform. And again, this industry is, is technologically uh, built out and capable as any, but that's going to need to be even more, particularly with, with a, a continued emphasis on cyber. So these are the big things that firms are talking about. But at the same time, uh, it, the industry has been quite resilient through this process, uh, as you cover day to day, uh, and that things work better than I think people thought. And, you know, we did a study at the request of the government right. back in 2007 on, a, on you know, uh, creating a playbook for pandemics. And this has worked better than I think people thought it would going back to then. So, Kevin, and Ken, as you say, it's worked. I mean, your members have made it work, to, which is to their credit. The markets have continued, capital markets have continued. At the same time, as you talk about extending further the period of time when people are going to be working from home to a very large degree, what do you think you give up? Is there discussion about that in the conference? Because there's no such thing as a free lunch. You give up something every time you make an adjustment. There's no question about it. And this is something both at this conference and executives that I talk to daily have talked about. I mean, there's the cultural aspect of teams working together. There's a collaborative effort. There's the, you know, was one of my um, executives talked about is, you know, cultural in indoctrination of that firm's particular uh, uh, culture. And then onboarding was just talking with uh, uh, Dana Emery of Dodge and Cox. Of, and this is something that comes up with many executives, onboarding new talent and how you bring that talent up and train them. Uh, th those things suffer 
in this environment. And so it has worked. It's not optimal. Uh, in the future, I think there will be more remote working than what we had going into this, but there's still a desire to get back to that collaborative framework. Again, Ken, you mentioned regulators and working closely with regulators. Let's talk about that for a minute. Looking forward, what are the regulatory issues that your industry faces? And let's be honest, would they be different under a President Biden than under a President Trump? President Trump has prided himself on deregulation. Has that been good for the industry? Well, I think what has been good is to go back and look at this tremendous rule set that was put in place post-Dodd-Frank on top of an already a tremendous rule set that's been in place for the industry for the last 70 plus years. And I think any regulator who was involved with that would acknowledge that it was at some point you had to go back and do a holistic review. And I think to a large extent that is what has been done. And there have been adjustments and calibrations around the edges of it that have made sense. And I think in this in this most recent environment where we went through this market dislocation, we saw where, in some cases, some of the capital and liquidity rules certainly got in the way of, of dealer banks being able to provide sufficient market making. And regulators, in fact, with a number of the, of the various policy levers that they put in place realized they had to make accommodations subsequently so that they would work as intended. So it's always worthwhile to go back and look at that. But I think the second thing that we're going to see is um, operational rules, supervisory rules, around uh, people working remote, uh, moving away from physical securities even more so than we have, getting away from things like wet signatures, looking at things like e-delivery um, that I think regulators are gonna have to deal with. And I don't think it necessarily matters in, in, th in that sense, whether it's a, a, a Trump administration or a Biden administration, these are things I think the policymakers, such as at the SEC, the CFTC, the Fed elsewhere, recognize we have to transcend uh, uh, the regulatory framework with the technological advances and, a, and, a, and also what a post-pandemic world is going to look like. Well, it's fascinating. So you're looking at an entirely different potential regulatory system in some ways, looking at a, in perpetuity, as you said, dematerializing securities. I heard you say that. But we're going to look at a different world for a lot of your members. Well, I mean, to some extent, this is always an, an evolving thing. I mean, you think about dematerialization of securities processing, you know, you, you just have to go back to Superstorm Sandy when DTCC's vaults were underwater. And, and even from that point forward, the, we had been moving in that in that transition. And frankly, you go back from when I was a banker a, a million years ago, you know, the world changed a lot from paper to where we got to Superstorm Sandy. That evolution is going to continue. It's events like these that push it along. One of the challenges that a lot of companies, not just in the security industry you had is preserving privacy and security as we go online, as we go virtual. What are the issues that have been raised for your industry in particular and what has been done? Well, you know, this industry, you know, has put, you know, tremendous effort and resources into privacy and data protection even before the pandemic. And so we had a good platform going into this situation where everything was going uh, remote, uh, everybody was on Zoom or whatever platform they might be using. But uh, there's no question that, you know, heavy lean on, you know, on communications technology, uh, uh, remoteness, you know, creates, uh, uh, you know, a, a potentially more risk, uh, something that this industry is well prepared for, but something that everyone's cognizant of, and we're going to have to continue to be well prepared for. And I think, David, one of the things that really came out of this uh, was the efforts that this industry's put in, pl in, in place through its business continuity planning exercise tr and training, and likewise with cyber resiliency. But that's just going to be increasingly more important going forward. Uh, Ken, finally, what does it do to the business model of a lot of your, your members? That is to say, is it a lot more money? When you talk about investing in technology, you talk about a lot of things you're talking about, it sounds like you have to, uh, you have uh, increased costs. Well, I, I think there's. I think the firms feel like there's good payoff on that cost because we're, we're we're an increasingly technological world as well, right? So it's not just the platforms, but it's also the people and the clients who are using technology. So I think firms have, have shown where they made the investment in technology that's paid off, whether it's in operational resiliency, data and privacy protection, or customer engagement. And I think that's just going to continue. Ken, thank you so much. Good luck with right. this conference you're having right now. It's Ken David, Benson. Thank you. Great to talk with you. That's SIFMA CEO. And tomorrow, we're going to be playing part of my conversation with TIAA CEO Roger Ferguson. That comes from a SIFMA panel. That's tomorrow morning. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It is time now for our Market Metrics segment, a look at how traders are bracing for the fallout stemming from the U.S. election, now just only 15 days away. To bring it to us is Scarlett Fu. Scarlett? Hi, David. Yeah, a few investors actually expect a government stimulus to pass before the election. But with Joe Biden leading in the polls right now, investors are increasingly pricing in a blue wave and significant government spending in 2021. And you can see how that is showing up in bullish bets on green energy and infrastructure over the past month. Now, a boost in these kind of old economy sectors would provide a lift to value stocks overall. And analysts are anticipating a 50 percent earnings growth for value stocks next year, which would be double the pace seen in growth stocks. And that's mainly because of easier comparisons for the value stocks and harder comparisons for the growth names. When you look at the S&P value index, however, it keeps attempting to stage a breakout and actually failing in the end. Since the start of the pandemic, it's hit the 1165 level four different times. And if you go back to a couple years ago, it always keeps bumping up against that level. So we've seen a couple of attempts and many failures. So Scott, that's a great review of equities. What about going beyond equities? What about bonds? What about currencies? What are we seeing there? Yeah, Democratic sweep and all its spending that it would entail would or could spur inflation, according to some people, and that would might that would probably send Treasury yields higher. Goldman Sachs, for one, says that could pull forward a Federal Reserve rate increase. What you're looking at here is uh, Fed fund futures, which indicate that rates will stay on hold until at least late 2021. And you'll recall that in September, the central bank made clear that it will keep rates lower for longer and will even tolerate inflation above 2 percent to ensure more robust employment. But Goldman Sachs says if you look further out, OIS, overnight index spreads, uh, swaps, I should say, those rates show that there's some pricing in of a Fed liftoff in late 2024, early 2025. So the strategist at Goldman, William Marshall, says if Fed rate hikes were to happen before then, it wouldn't so much affect the front end of the yield curve, but you could see some volatility around the five-year mark, the belly of the curve, because that part of the curve captures a big part of the hiking cycle. So as a result, Goldman recommends investors you use longer-dated options on swaps called swaptions to position for potential Fed rate hikes. As for what that means for the U.S. dollar, that really depends on where uh, the Federal Reserve goes. Right now, there isn't much impetus for the dollar to rise uh, in the near term. And in fact, I was looking at research from Dan Clifton over at Strategas, who has made the point that over the last couple of days and weeks, the dollar really hasn't gone anywhere, not giving much of an indication of who's likely to win the election. Okay, thank you so much, Scarlett. That was terrific market metrics. I love it. Scarlett Fu reporting for us. Up next, our Swing State series turns to the pivotal state of Pennsylvania. And we talk with political science professor Terry Madonna of Franklin and Marshall College to get, that, get us started. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. In China, economic recovery from the pandemic continued in the third quarter. GDP rose 4.9 percent from a year ago. That is less than expected, but higher than the second quarter number. Meantime, China's retail sales grew 3.3 percent in September, and industrial production was up almost 7 percent. Bloomberg has learned that British officials are prepared to water down Prime Minister Boris Johnson's controversial law-breaking Brexit legislation. That's a move that could revive failing talks with the European Union. Prime Minister Johnson's internal market bill rewrites part of the Brexit deal he struck with the EU last year. And news breaking now, the UK government just said it believes this is no basis to resume EU trade talks. It's the largest deal in the shale industry since the collapse in energy demand earlier this year. ConocoPhillips has agreed to buy Contro Resources for $9.7 billion in stock. The takeover will create a heavyweight driller in America's most prolific oil field, the Permian Basin of West Texas and New Mexico. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts 
in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you very much, Mark. Our Swing State series turns to Pennsylvania this week. One of the keys to President Trump's victory in 2016 was his narrow win in the Keystone State. And to set up the stage for us this time, we welcome now Terry Madonna. He is professor of public affairs at Franklin and Marshall College, where he is the director of the Center for Politics and Public Affairs. So, Professor, thank you so much for being with us. You're setting the stage for us here. Tell us what we need to know about Pennsylvania as we look at it election night. All right, great. All right, let's start with this. Uh, as you accurately point out, uh, Pennsylvania gave Donald Trump a victory by 44,000 votes, less than one percentage points. Uh, the fact of the matter is that President Trump carried Pennsylvania because his campaign developed what we, what they called, and we now routinely call the Rust Belt strategy. That was to go after white working class voters in portions of our state, and by the way, the same is true for some of the other Midwestern battleground states, where mining and milling were once dominant and where the ancestors of, of these working class voters worked in coal and iron and steel. And of course, now natural gas has become a huge part of the Pennsylvania economy. So what happened was Donald Trump and, and in six counties out in southwestern PA that Trump won, every single one of them had at the time a Democratic voter registration edge. And Trump won those counties, not by five points, not by 10, not by 15, but by 19, 20, and two of them by 30 points, two of them by 30 points. And the same as if you go up in the Northeast in counties right. where anthracite coal was once dominant, Trump carried uh, two, two counties up there. Right. And I want to mention one, Lackawanna County. I bring this up because Scranton is, is the biggest city in Lackawanna. Yeah. And, and of, of course, Joe Biden lived there until he was 10 and talks about it all the time when he's in the state. And the bottom right. line here is Trump only lost Lackawanna County to Hillary Clinton by 3,500 votes. Wow. And he won a county out in the Northwest right. on Lake Erie, Erie County. So right. basically, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say, I, I, I think looking back, at least my take, for my home state of Michigan, I can tell you, there was a lot of dissatisfaction with what had come before. Uh, the question is, what about today? Because now President Trump has been right. president for four years. I saw from your poll, your Franklin and Marshall poll, that people in the state of Pennsylvania are not all that happy with where things are heading. Oh, no, you're absolutely right. In fact, the Real Clear Politics average right now has... Uh, Biden up by 4.4 percentage points that had reached seven points a couple of weeks ago. But the fundamental problem is, yes, yes. Uh, when we when we ask about the country moving in the right direction, no way, no how. In fact, Trump's biggest problem in this state and many other states is obviously the coronavirus problem. At one point months ago, he was about 50 percent positive. In, in our state, he's about four, 39, 40% positive on handling uh, COVID-19. And that's been his most serious problem. But here's the key takeaway. Here's the key takeaway. The problem the Republicans are having in Pennsylvania and a number of the battleground states is with suburban voters. A decade ago, the suburbs in our country were a wholly owned subsidiary of the Republican Party. In Pennsylvania, for example, in the midterm election, the Republicans picked, the Democrats picked up three of the four congressional seats in the Philadelphia suburbs. And that was part of the Democratic wave that put uh, the Democrats in control of the federal house. Obviously, Nancy Pelosi is now speaker. Right. And particularly, the Republicans are having a problem with white college-educated women and with millennials. Right. College-educated women have moved sharply away from the Republicans and away from President Trump as well. The other group are millennials that in my state and many other, well, let, I'll put it this way. In 2016, the millennials, right. 80 million, 80 million of them, 23 to 38 year olds now, 23 right. to 38. They right. gave a bigger percentage of their vote to Hillary Clinton than any other age cohort, Gen X, baby right. boomers, silent generation. Right. So make no mistake about it, 
The big reason right now that President Trump is trailing in Pennsylvania is the yeah. suburbs that have shifted heavily towards the Democrats, and he's not doing as well as he did four years ago with working class voters. So, so that's we that's my are, question. That's my question, actually, Professor. If if we're going to look at it election night, should we be mainly focused on the suburbs, particularly Philadelphia, but those suburbs in uh, Philadelphia versus the Southwest out toward the coal country? Is that the battle that's going to be fought? I think, yeah, I think you're exactly right. You're exactly right about that. And that Biden has spent a good bit of his time in this state. He has gone out into the Southwest a month ago or so. He was in Allegheny County out there. Now that's that's still solidly uh, blue. And he said, oh, by the way, I am for fracking. What's the fracking bit? Well, it's a huge part of the economy. It's that deep drilling that goes on to remove natural gas from the soil. And that's a big issue in the southwestern part of our state. And Biden wanted to right. make sure he has appealed to the working class voters saying, guess what? Right. The president hasn't improved your uh, livelihood. The jobs aren't there. Right. And we are by far the most visited state in the union. So if you want to talk about battleground states, I joke and say the candidates and their surrogates are spending so much time in the state of Pennsylvania, yeah. we're going to give them residency. P Professor, I don't want to let you go without asking one quick last question. As you know so well, often it's a question of momentum. It's not where you start. It's where you're moving toward an election day. Is the momentum shifting in Pennsylvania right now at least somewhat toward President Trump? Yeah, a bit, a bit. He still has the problems that I pointed out. And here's the other problem, as you well know. Mail-in ballots are dominating the election and far more Democrats are getting mail-in ballots than Republicans. More Republicans are going to vote in person. And that's, and until we get all, you know, know exactly how many and in what states, particularly the battleground states, Pennsylvania, Florida, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, and North Carolina, the big six, I call them, uh, we're going to have to wait and see. But there isn't any doubt that nationally the momentum is still with the uh, uh, Vice President Biden, but there is, but the lead in many of these battleground right. states has narrowed a bit. I'm not suggesting that Biden yeah. won't win them, but I'm just saying he leads in all of them right now. Yeah but not the percentages that he led uh, two weeks ago. Exactly. It certainly is far from over. Very fair point. Thank you so much, Professor Terry Madonna of Franklin and Marshall College. Coming up, we continue our tour of Pennsylvania with its former governor, Ed Rendell. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. There aren't many, maybe none, who know Pennsylvania, and particularly the politics of Pennsylvania, like Ed Rendell. After serving as mayor of Philadelphia, he went on to be its governor for two terms, as well as chair of the Democratic National Party. And we welcome him now back to Bloomberg. So, Governor, what, great to have you here. Mr. Pennsylvania, we're looking at Pennsylvania all this week as a swing state. Tell us what we need to know going into the election. Well, going into the election, Joe Biden has a fairly solid lead. Although uh, I am a believer in the Trump effect on polls, I think two or three percent of the respondents lie to the pollsters. They're embarrassed to admit, even to a stranger, that they're voting for Donald Trump. So I think he runs three points better than he polls. So when Hillary was only ahead by three points going into the Monday before Election Day, I said on TV, I thought we could run into some trouble on Pennsylvania. And unfortunately, I was right. But Biden's lead is closer to seven or eight. And if he holds five or more going into Election Day, he's in pretty good shape. Is, is uh, the former Vice President Biden ahead by seven in the state of Pennsylvania? Because I've seen some polls that have it narrower than that. Yeah, and there's some polls that have it more than seven. And that's the net average. Gotcha. So are you reasonably confident? <laughs> Reasonably confident. You never know. I mean, the debate, although this debate is probably less impactful than any third, any last debate in presidential history since we've been having debates, because most people have made up their mind. Plus, there's a ton of people who voted by mail already in Pennsylvania. So it's going to be hard to affect it as much as it was in the old days. 
Um, and Biden is, is winning two ways. One, he's going to almost double the margin that Hillary Clinton got in the Philadelphia suburbs. Hillary carried the four suburban counties by a margin of 180. I think Biden's going to carry by 300. Uh, and then secondly, Biden is not losing the rural counties by nearly as much as Hillary did. So if a rural county went 75-25 for Donald Trump, it's going 69 to 31 for Joe Biden. And in each one of those counties, and they're small, relatively small counties, in each one of those counties, Biden is picking up five or six percent. Uh, he's five or six points better than Hillary did. So if you combine those, and he should have a fairly significant win. But it's politics. There's still two weeks to go. There's still one debate to go. There's still an October or November surprise possible, although it doesn't look likely. So you can't say it's over. And the one thing that we're fighting here, it's apathy. You know, the polls are, in some cases, almost too good. And we're reminding people what happened to Hillary in the last two weeks. So we're trying to keep the enthusiasm level up. But, boy, the early votes are unbelievable. The lines for people trying to drop off their envelopes are unbelievable. Well, what's the strategy uh, for a presidential candidate in Pennsylvania? You basically have to build up a really big surplus in the East, particularly in Philadelphia, the suburbs of Philadelphia, to overcome what you might lose out in the West? Yeah, no question. I won my first election as governor against Mike Fisher, a Republican, a very good candidate. I carried 15 out of 67 counties. But I came out of Philadelphia and the four suburban counties, 800,000 votes up. And it was impossible to catch me after that. But again, I won 15 counties out of 67 and won the general election by a margin of 10 points. What's the perception of how uh, the president has handled COVID-19? Because there's been some, as I understand it, uh, resistance among some citizens of Pennsylvania to the extent to which there's been shutdowns of the state. Yeah, there's been some resistance. But the people of Pennsylvania, it's pretty much the same as nationally. 70, 72, 73 percent think that we ought to make mask wearing mandatory. But you've got a vocal minority on the other side, no, no question about it. Uh, but, but that issue cuts dramatically in Biden's favor. I think uh, Trump was uh, much closer before, at the beginning of the year, he was a, even bet to carry Pennsylvania. I think COVID has been a real blow to him. Uh, no question about it. Uh, the, the economy, and particularly jobs, are going to loom large in everybody's mind. Certainly, I think that's why President Trump has really gone after former Vice President Biden on the question of fracking in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, is it true that still in Pennsylvania, people overall give an edge to Donald Trump in handling of the economy over Joe Biden? Yeah, I'd say a very small edge, though, much less than it was uh, two months ago. Um, and fracking, Joe Biden is, is for fracking. The only thing he said is, he wouldn't let fracking happen on publicly owned lands. But he's definitely for fracking. And remember, I was the governor who opened up fracking in Pennsylvania, so it was a good issue for Democrats. Governor Wolf, the current governor, Democrat, is very much pro-fracking. And so is Joe Biden. It's Natural gas is an important bridge, which produces a, the burning of natural gas produces one half of the carbon that the burning of coal produces. So it's an important and environmentally better bridge to the future when someday we can get all of our electricity by uh, renewables. But that day is, at best, 20 years away. Governor Rendell, finally, are we going to get a clean and clear answer out of Pennsylvania? Because, as you know, it looks like there are going to have record numbers of mail-in ballots, absentee ballots across the country. There are already disputes that have arisen. We have a problem here in New York, you may have heard of, where there are 100,000 ballots that went out that were defective. It's really raising questions about the legitimacy of the process. What's the situation in Pennsylvania when it comes to the process of the voting? Well, we've never had a problem with absentee ballots before, but absentee ballots in the old days, you had to either be disabled or out of the county to get an absentee ballot. This is the first time we had absentee ballots on demand. Now, now they weren't mailed out in mass. You had to mail a request or email a request for, an ad, for a mail ballot. You got it, then you filled it out and sent it back in. Um, what's going to happen is, is, in the primary, 70% of the Democrats 
voted by absentee ballot, only 25 percent of the Republicans did. So it is likely that when midnight arrives on election night, Donald Trump will still be ahead in, in the voting, because it'll be mostly the people who voted at the polls, and that'll be significantly tilted towards the Republicans. But as the mail ballots are counted the next day and the day after that, Joe Biden should, if the, the polls are correct, should pass Trump. But that fact alone is going to give rise to, oh, the election was stolen from us. But Donald Trump's forces can go into court, but in court they have to do something that they don't have to do when they get on Bloomberg TV or <laughs> CNN. They have to have evidence. <laughs> there is no evidence of widespread voting fraud. Donald Trump talks about the eight ballots yeah, yeah. That, were, that had Trump votes in it that were thrown in a creek. Right. That was done by a temporary worker, and it was done in a county that the Republicans control the election right. apparatus. Right. Governor, it's always such a treat to have you with us. That is Governor Ed Rendell. He's the former Democratic governor of the state of Pennsylvania. Coming up, we broaden out from Pennsylvania to take a look more broadly at the national race with Bloomberg political contributor Jeannie Zeno. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi says she's still hopeful about a possible fourth round of stimulus. But if it's to happen, it has to happen by tomorrow, she says. Welcome now, Bloomberg political contributor, uh, <laughs> she's professor of political science at Iona College. She is Jeannie Zeno. So, Jeannie, thank you so much for being with us. Is it going to happen tomorrow? You know, I am not confident we're going to see a deal tomorrow. We may see something between Pelosi and Mnuchin. Absolutely, that could happen. But it also has to go through the Senate. And as much as Mitch McConnell wants to get something through, I'm not sure Republicans in the Senate are going to go along with it at this point. So it's still an uphill battle. So if it doesn't happen, if it doesn't happen, who does it hurt? Who does it help? I think if it doesn't happen, it hurts the president. I think that's why we've seen him do an about-face on this, why he's willing to do more. I think it also hurts some Senate candidates out there. You know, you look in Maine, you look at, the, you know, the race going there for the Senate. Susan Collins would like nothing more than to be able to tell those voters that she had her name on this deal. But I think you've got what is, remains a split Senate in terms of the Republicans. They're, they're not certain the president is going to win, and they're not sure they want to put their name on a bill that's this large going forward, given the fact that they're supposed to be cautious about spending. So, Jeannie, we've been talking about Pennsylvania, as you know, today. All this week we will be. But let's talk about broad, more broadly. Uh, there seems to be a sense that certainly Joe, Joe Biden, the former vice president, continues to have a lead. It's not quite as stubborn as it was, and particularly in some of those battleground or swing states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, maybe it's eroding. What's your sense of where the race is right now? You know, I do think Republicans are nervous. I think the president's team is nervous. I think we've seen some of that with Senate candidates like Ben Sass um, calling out the president. Um, so I do think we've seen some movement and concern there. But I also think that it is way too early, given the number of unknowns in this race, way too early to call this thing for Joe Biden. And I think the Biden team is cognizant of that. Um, you know, I think the president's team still feels that they have a pathway forward, that through the Sun Belt and up to a state like the one you're talking about all this week, which is Pennsylvania, they still feel they could take that state. And I do think that there is a reason to be very cautious about these these polls showing these huge leads. I do think Biden wins nationally, but again, it's going to come down to these swing states, and Trump can absolutely still pull this through when you've got races at 5 6 3% in some of these swing states. And, Jeannie, as you know so well, as you get into the last stages of the campaign, momentum really counts. I mean, things can move there in the last week or two. They can move more than you might expect. At the same time, as we compared to four years ago and what happened to Hillary Clinton, people tend to leave out a little thing called Comey. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, so there's so much that can still happen. And I think co- Democrats and the, the Biden team are cognizant of that. You know, we, we saw, uh, you know, an attempt to sway the race with the release of the Hunter Biden material doesn't seem to have resonated. But we've still got time to go. We've got a debate on Thursday, potentially, if it goes forward. So there is still time for there to be another October, early November surprise, if you will, that shakes this thing up. So I I do think you have to be cognizant. Biden's got a lot going for him, including his uh, fundraising, which has been tremendous at this point for the Democrats and is far outweighing the the president's. But I'm looking this weekend and the president crisscrossing the country. He is energetic and they are getting crowds as big as 16 and I think the campaign feels like if they can turn out a vote that's equivalent mm-hmm. to 16, they can make a race of this in states like Pennsylvania. So quickly here at the end, GD, one big October surprise is it would be if President Trump comes out on Thursday night and is a different President Trump, which, according to the press at least, some of his aides are advising him to change. Yeah, absolutely. If he comes out and he focuses on the economy, you know, there's that Gallup poll out a few days ago saying that, you know, over 50 percent of Americans think they are better off economically today than they were four years ago, Mm. despite the pandemic. Those are big numbers. If the president can focus on that and make the case that he could do even better getting us out of this, he has an argument to make to those still undecided moderate voters in places like Pennsylvania. It's the economy, stupid. We've heard that before. (laughs) Okay, thanks so much for Bloomberg Political contributor Jeannie Zeno. She'll be with us for coverage of that final presidential debate Thursday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time here on Bloomberg Television and Radio. And a programming note, tomorrow we'll be speaking with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi in an exclusive interview. That's at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. In our second hour on radio, we're going to talk about China. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.